Welcome to our next, our, uh, our Early Head Start Rising series. Um, I'm so excited to see such, such a great audience here. We've had so many good conversations so far, um, and we've focused a lot on health, and we will continue to do that. But today we're going to sort of take a little bit of a, of a veering off, but not totally, because I think executive function and, and engaging parents is a big part of healthy development. And I think Aaron and Dan would probably agree with me on that. Um, we have two wonderful guests with us today, Aaron Ramsey and Dan Torres, and they're going to talk to you about executive function. And there's a really fun family engagement piece to this that you're going to learn about. Um, and I personally find the process of executive function development to be something that's probably under appreciated in any kind of child development, education. It is such an important part of regular day-to-day -day living. Um, and if we can focus on this a little bit with our kiddos and even our staff and our parents, um, I think we will find everyone does better in the long run. So I, I think you're also gonna learn a little bit about yourself today too, which is always a lot of fun. So I, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Erin. And she and Dan are gonna run the show for the most of this hour. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about Mind in the Making and how, if you're interested, you can get involved in it. So I will stop talking. Take it away, Erin. Well, thank you, Dr. B. And I'm so glad to be here, especially with all of the early Head Start. I love that you're having your own series. I actually um, live in rural Kentucky and my daughter-in-law is an early Head Start teacher. So this is near and dear to my heart. Um, and my third grandson goes to school with her every day. So it's really awesome. So I'm Erin Ramsey and I'm the manager of Mind in the Making at the Bezos Family Foundation. And then Dan Torres is with me. I think you guys can see him there with his broom. Uh, he's my colleague, he's in Seattle and he's gonna share broom. I'm gonna start with Mind in the Making for a good portion of the hour. And then uh, Dan will just give you some really great free resources that you can use with families and, your, and if you're a teacher or your staff um, to use that. So as usual, total honor to be doing anything with Head Start. It's near and dear to the Bezos Family Foundation. We know the impact that you have on children and families and we're so um, glad to be in partnership with the National Head Start Association to really try to bring the science of learning into the classroom, to engage families and engage uh, teachers and, and peripheral staff around executive function because it really does affect everything in life. So I'm gonna share my screen and I love seeing where everybody's from. Um, and I think I see a few really familiar names. So if our paths are crossed, go ahead and put it in the chat. Let me get my screen up. Oh, you need to enable me, Dr. B. It's not muted now. Okay, let me. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. And you're on mute. Just made you a co host. Okay, so let me you try. You should be able to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to work. Yay. All right. Okay. So um, I'm going to give you an overview in a, in a, a really, you know, quick overview of Mind in the Making, the seven essential life skills, and some of the precursors to the development of executive function. Um, and we'll keep it a focus as much as possible on infants and toddlers and how this information can apply to your work. Um, so Mind in the Making is an ongoing effort to curate the science of children's brain development and learning to share it with the general public, families and professionals and to translate this research into action. And so you'll, you'll see, I'll, I'll tell you about the seven skills and executive function, and then we'll, we'll try to apply it in ways that will be useful for you as, as we leave our time um, together. So Ellen Galinsky wrote a book called Mind in the Making, the seven essential life skills every child needs. 
And this is her one part of her office at home of all the research that she read and, and conducted herself. But I, I start with the story because I think it brings together the, the science and the heart. And so Ellen did set out to write a book. She was actually doing a study on learning in America. And this is probably close to 17 years ago now. And she's a researcher, so she knows how to ask questions. So kids and, and adults will answer the questions. She was doing focus groups all over the country. And she was asking kids around six to 12 graders, tell me about a time you were learning and tell me about a time you were not learning. And basically most of the respondents couldn't really respond to tell me about a time you were learning. And they could talk a mile a minute about times they were not learning. And she, she had to go back, revamp the questions. And she was thinking, you know, what, what's going on? And then around the same time, Indiana University did a study with the same demographic and asked the, asked the youth, why do you go to school? And uh, most of the respondents, not all, but a good, good, you know, a high percentage said things like to get a good job, to make my parents happy, you know, um, to get into the right college. All the things that they were responding with are what we call extrinsic motivators. So doing something to get something. Very few respondents were saying, you know, the pursuit of knowledge, curiosity, passion. And so, um, and then it was a perfect storm in Ellen's life. Her two neighbor, her neighbors adopted two little girls from a foreign country. And once they got their health back, she just saw the fire burning in their eyes and in their belly for learning. Like all of you see every day with your young ones. And she started to think, you know, we must be doing something as a country or as a culture, or as an education system that's putting that fire out. You know, how can these children come from most adverse situations and just still have that fire burning? So the study that started with learning in America actually evolved into the seven life skills. So Ellen started doing the research across um, specialties. So neuroscience, cognitive science, behavior science, and what started to bubble up were executive functions. But the whole, the whole impetus is how do we keep the love of learning alive? And the work that we do in communities and the work that we do in partnership with the National Head Start Association is making sure ourselves as adults keep our fire burning bright so we can help the children and families that we're serving do the same. So there's a few premises that we operate from, and I know that this is preaching to the choir, but I do wanna lay the foundation um, to this as we move into the executive function discussion. And so in the first few years, um, you know, all of the neural connections are being made, forming the foundation for how you know, you're learning now and in the future. So the architecture of the brain. And in this video, I'm not going to show videos, one, because I live in rural Kentucky because <laughs> it's rainy day, but two, um, because we don't have a ton of time. But if you do want to learn more about mind making, you'll be able to watch all of these videos. And in this one, Sam Wang from Princeton talks about how it's all the everyday interactions. Like you can look at a child be eating a banana, but when you start to think about what's happening in their brain for them to be eating that banana or talking to you or making eye contact with you, it's so phenomenal in what's actually happening in the architecture of the brain. And everything begins with relationships. So that's why executive function is so important for adults, because if you're using your executive function, then you'll be able to be present be able to watch the babies or the toddlers or the preschoolers and what they're doing and, and how to respond and be engaged. So the second thing is the positive relationships with caring adults are essential for brain development. Um, and this would be an experiment that you would watch. It's the still face where if an adult just stares or does a blank face, the baby will try to re-engage with crying or reaching out and then will withdraw if there's no response. And then the research shows that what's most important is the reconnection and creating that bond and how important it is that we're not totally distracted and that we're able to uh, respond to the babies. So without, without understanding, with understanding brain development and then understanding our impact as adults on the baby and the brain is just essential because these are the precursors for um, executive function. And then the third premise that we're working uh, or, or promoting is the back and forth interactions. And so if you remember, if some of you may, some of you may not, and I'm aging myself, but when I was an undergrad getting a child development degree, that's when Newsweek came out with the baby as a sponge and all the new brain research came out and everybody kept saying, oh yeah, kids are just sponges. 
Well, now the science has shown us that the baby's brain is built for action. So, and it goes all to the class and the interaction and the feedback loops, that it's the back and forth interaction that is the most important in brain development and in language development. So being able to engage, watch, go back and forth and not to drown children in words, what they're also finding out through this research with Pat Kuhl out of the University of Washington is that it's about relevancy and context so that you're not just talking to talk, but you're actually talking and responding back and forth and it's what's actually happening, um, not just to talk so you just hear things. And in this research with Patricia Kuhl, um, you can see how the baby's brain is lighting up. And the really interesting is, thing is she's discovered the brokest part of the brain is actually visualizing the words before they talk. And you can see that, especially those of you that work with toddlers, you know, sometimes the toddler will be watching and listening. And then one day they just say the word crystal clear out of the blue. Well, it wasn't out of the blue. You can see it happening in their brain as they're listening and hearing it over and over again. So that research is really um, important. The other important part about this research, one, obviously the back and forth, that the baby's brain is not a sponge, that it is really about action, and that's how they learn language and develop. Um, and that parentes is a really important, that sing-songy sound in your voice when you're working with infants and toddlers is really important. And there was a movement in the country where people were saying, don't talk baby, talk to your baby. And you really do want to use that natural sing song sound. You just want it to be grammatically correct is the most important thing. And then the fourth premise that we're operating on is obviously the executive function and how important it is to promote that. So the positive relationships, the back and forth interactions and understanding the rapid pace in which brains are developing are all the precursors to the promotion of executive function. Executive function really starts to become developing around three, four and five and then through adulthood. So, um, but without that, you're not laying a good foundation. Executive function is really important. And um, if you don't know what it is, I'm gonna tell you in this very short amount of time together, but executive function refers to the top-down neurocognitive processes involved in the flexible goal-directed problem solving. And that's Phil Zalazzo at the University of Minnesota. And what it starts with is um, being able to be cognitively flexible. So being able to take in information and think about it in different ways, not getting like just one track in your thinking, but that you can shift to different demands, working memory. So being able to keep information in mind and then use it, you know, like mental math or past experiences. And then inhibitory control is just not going automatic and being able to stop yourself um, you know, even when it's hard, right? So those are the foundations. But as we grow, as children grow and as adults grow and, and you know, improve their executive function, it develops into planning, analyzing, and reflecting, which is, you know, obviously really key life skills. Now you can see this and you think, well, yeah, okay, cognitive flexibility, working memory, inhibitory control, yeah, those are important. But really think about somebody you know, and it, it could even be you that might be really struggling in one area of your life or maybe in lots of different areas, it usually really will come down to some component of executive function. Um, and the good news is it's never too late. We can always improve our executive function. And if you decide you wanna go through the Mind of the Making series, there's all kinds of things we call factors that matter that you can do to promote executive function in yourself and in, and in others. So let's just test your executive function real fast. I'm gonna stop my screen share because I like to see everybody do this. All right, and I love if your cameras are on, that's great too. So I don't feel like I'm just talking to a slide deck. So it's nice to see everybody. Um, so let's just, you can stay in your seat or wherever you are. If you're driving or walking down the hallway, don't try to do it, but um, take your right foot and get it going in a circle. Okay, just lean back and just kind of lift it and going in a circle. Got it? Keep your foot going. And then take your left hand and make a six. All right. All right. Now, if we were a person and everybody was unmuted, we'd all be cracking up because uh, you, you might think you're doing it, but it's unlikely that you are. Um, 
and you can practice if you want, you probably be able to do it. But this is just an exercise with the example of it's you're using your cognitive flexibility, right? You're thinking, okay, what did Aaron say to do? Okay, how can I make this happen without crisscrossing all over the place, right? Using your working memory because I gave you some directions and you're inhibiting yourself. You're trying not to let your foot go the other way and your finger go the other way. So it's just a good example of how even to engage kids. In fact, I often think about when I was a child, we always played rub your belly, pat your belly, rub your head or rub your belly, pat your head. So we were naturally playing these games. That's a total promotion of executive function, right? Um, all right, so let me do this. This is gonna be, this is gonna be funny on mute, but I'm gonna try it and then everybody can start laughing at yourself, okay? So what I'm gonna do is put my fingers up and we're gonna say 10, 10 times together. And even if you're by yourself, just say it out loud, okay? Put your hand. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. 10. And what are aluminum cans made of? Okay, well, I can't hear you. And I know Dr. B doesn't want to unmute 200 people. But my guess is, is a lot of you may have said 10. Right. And so what we did was I got you on automatic, even though we're talking about executive function, you know, I'm probably playing tricks on you. Many of you probably said 10, because we were saying 10, 10, 10. And I asked you what aluminum cans were made of. And you went on automatic and said 10, 10, even though you know that aluminum cans are made of aluminum. Now, let me tell you this trick as you're working with older toddlers and preschoolers, but you can do this a lot of ways with toddlers too. There's lots of games and babies that you can play. Um, if I would have said, I'm gonna say 10, 10, 10, 10 times together. I'm gonna ask you a question. I want you to stop and think about the answer. All of you would have said aluminum. Right. So it's that stop and pause to give yourself that time and space to be flexible in your thinking, to kind of inhibit your first response. And you can you can play games like, you know, freeze dance, play fast music and play slow music. So you dance slow and you dance with fast music. So you play opposites. There's all peekaboo with babies is a great way um, to promote executive function. So just a few little tests there. And you might have played many games um, that do the same thing as a child. All right, we'll go back. Um, and then what Mind of the Making is, is really the how of learning. It's not the what to teach. And that's why a lot of programs really like it because it really supports all of the you know, curriculum that you, whatever curriculum you're using, it will support the why. And it gives teachers a real understanding of why we're doing what we're doing and how to best so, meet where, where people and how they learn best at whatever age um, is really important. So it's the how of learning. And, you know, when, when you look at the school standards as kids get older, a lot of times we're asked to learn a whole bunch of things and just a little bit about them. Um, and now standards are trying to be revamped to you learn deep learning and you're able to transfer knowledge, right? So you might get really deep into one subject matter and, and all of your different skills are developed within that. And that's all executive function, to be able to learn something and then apply it in a different way. So if we really wanna set kids up for success, we need to be really aware of executive function and how to promote it. Here's another one, and this is really important for the Head Start community. Um, this is one of Ellen's favorite studies, but this study showed it was a longitudinal study that executive functions are predictive of physical health, substance dependence, criminal convictions, personal finances achieved at age 32. Now here's the clincher. After controlling for socioeconomic status of origin and IQ. So the promotion of executive function, which we all can learn and get better at at any time, it's never too late, is more important whether you're in poverty or not, or whether you have a high IQ or not. So this is where we can really start leveling the playing field um, by promoting executive function. And then the fifth is skill building strategies, which is autonomy support, which is, has so much to do with developmentally appropriate practices, good class scores and interactions. But um, we've, we've called it skill building strategies because adults who engage in skill building strategies or autonomy support behavior are promoting executive function and they are using their own executive function. And so this is a really new trend of research in child development. You're gonna hear a lot about autonomy support 
over the next few years. Um, but here's our definitions of it. I know this is a lot of words for a screen, um, but what the four main components of autonomy support are taking the child's view. So really seeing what they know, what they don't know, and keeping that information in mind when you're interacting with them. And this is all so important with babies and toddlers too. And then share reasons, you know, have the boundaries and letting them know why you're doing what you're doing or why they can't do something and making sure that they're, that you're predictable and that they're taking an active role. Um, and then the active role is really important because what we found and what we continue to find in the field is that everybody's fixing everything for the kids. So they're not ever getting into a problem solving mode, which is executive function. So really, you know, not just having a free for all or let them struggle to the end of time, but let them really be a part of the solution. And you can even do this for babies who are trying to reach a pacifier or try to do something hard. You could be there guiding them rather than just handing them something, right? And same, and then as kids get older, they can really come up with their own solutions about things that are challenging, you know, together as a team. Because with autonomy support, what you don't wanna do is be like laissez-faire, free-for-all, and you don't wanna be like over-controlling. You wanna kind of be in the middle and that's where these are. And then scaffolding, and we know all too well, I've been in child development, early childhood education for 30 plus years. And I know that this is one of the hardest things for teachers to do. And it's really seeing where the child is and then you know, making sure that it's not too hard, but hard enough that it gives the child a chance to develop their own skills. So meeting them where they are and then helping them learn instead of giving a too hard of assignment or, you know, a, a challenge or too easy. So that's skill building strategies. Those are really important and they are totally in tandem with the promotion of executive function. Um, and so the other really important inherent developmental needs, so the things we can do with the autonomy support, the things that we really need to consider. And again, if you, if you decide you want to go on the mind making learning journey, you'll see all the video research of this. Um, but our developmental needs around this are to feel confident, right? Children and adults want to feel confident. They want to feel autonomous, which means that they have some control, they feel respected, right? And to feel connected, which is where all of the talk around our positive relationships, that there's a belonging and that there's trust and that you know they're, they're meant to be there together, sense of community, especially in our classrooms. So if we're gonna make a difference in school readiness and school success and workforce readiness, I mean, this is um, you know lifelong, um, we need to keep that spark of love of learning alive. And it really does start with executive function and autonomy support. We're not saying that these are the silver bullets, but we're saying it's a really good idea um, to try to promote them. So Ellen called the research, like I told you, across sciences, executive function bubbled up, which you know what that is now, if you didn't know before, cognitive flexibility, thinking you know, flexibly, uh, working memory and inhibitory control. Um, she came up with the seven life skills. I'm just going to briefly go through them so that Dan can jump in and share the room information. Um, but I'll try to give you a few factors that matter, things you can do with each life skill, especially with infants and toddlers, so you have a few takeaways. Um, so focus and self-control is the first life skill. Each of the life skills build on the previous life skill. And so focus and self-control is exactly what you would think being able to pay attention, to stay on task when things are hard, to follow directions, to um, you know, be, be present. And so one of the, this is a really funny quintessential child development study that has been um, redone so many times in so many different ways, but it really is what it comes down to is they have one marshmallow, but if they wait 15 minutes and they don't ring the bell, then they can have two marshmallows. And the kids who had the strategies um, were able to wait the 15 minutes. And what is so excited about, these are preschoolers, but the exciting thing about this is that the strategies can be learned. It's not like, oh, I have good focus and self-control or I don't. If you're struggling in area, you just need some more strategies and you can develop your own strategies, which gives us a lot of hope. It gives me hope personally. It gives um, the future for our kids a lot of hope. And we wanna make sure that we're looking through the lens of strategy. So, so many kids are doing things to manage, but they're getting in trouble for it. But rather than getting kids in trouble, what we should be doing is saying, you're doing that as a strategy to help manage. Let's think about another way you could manage that 
that will, you know, fit the situation. And then they can co problem solve as they get a little bit older. Um, focus and self control. Another great way to promote executive function with this is to play skill games. So, like peekaboo with babies or, you know, the music games, like I was telling you. And then once kids have it mastered, I mean, maybe not infants, but toddlers and younger preschoolers, then you could change the rules, you know, once they know the game really well. And then as soon as you change the rule, you have to go back all to your executive function again, right? You have to remember, okay, what's the new rule? Okay, how am I gonna play this game? You get a kind of flexible. Then you have to inhibit yourself not to go back to the way that you were playing before. So games are a huge way to promote executive function. And you can do that at transition time or just normal play time. Um, perspective taking as a seventh, second life skill. And when I first saw perspective taking, I thought, oh, empathy. And, Empathy is a part of perspective taking, but it's much more. It includes theory of mind research, which researchers call it. You could get in the mind of somebody else. So perspective taking is being able to inhibit your own thoughts and feelings and think about how that other person might be thinking and feeling, even if you don't feel it. And that's the difference with empathy. You feel it, right? Perspective taking is using all your executive function to step out, inhibit, and think about it. And the way that you can, a really important way, these are some experiments on theory of mind, um, a really important way that you can promote perspective taking is through dramatic play, role playing, what better way to take on a perspective of somebody else than to take on a whole nother role. And then this is really fun research from Stephanie Carlson out of uh, University of Minnesota. And she found that they lock these toys in this box and they give the kids keys that don't work. So, you know, it's a frustrating task. And those that they got to pick a, a character to be, so this little boy picked Batman and he has a Batman cape on. And then they, the researcher tells the child, you know, do what Batman would do. The kids who take on another role or think about it, they call it psychologically distancing. So they're, th you know, they have a separation between them and the task and then who they're thinking about being, can perform the task at, at a length that would be a year older than they actually were. So they were able to work harder, longer, if they were thinking about Dora or Batman or whatever. It's a really interesting experiment. So perspective taking, but without, without focus and self-control, it's really hard to be a perspective taker because you're not going to be able to inhibit your own thoughts and feelings. So you can see how the skills build on each other. Then the third skill is communicating. And with communicating, you would think exactly as it is, reading, writing, and speaking. But the little nuance here based on executive function research is really thinking about what you want to communicate. You yourself, or even how do we teach children to think about what they want to communicate? And you, you're doing that all the time with infants, right? So uh, it's that stepping back, thinking, and then as they get older, and as we work in our own lives with our own families and in our own professions and, and roles, if you can stop yourself, think about what the other person knows, might be feeling, and then you communicate accordingly. I mean, think about how much higher level of quality of communication that we would be having, right? And I even think about my career, like all the times I left and said, oh, they just don't get it because I didn't stop to think what they knew and didn't know. And then I didn't communicate accordingly. So it's really on me, right? Not on the other person. So think about that as you're engaging with your colleagues, your own families, um, the families that you're serving, um, really think about the perspective of the other person and then how you wanna move forward. So again, the give and take conversations are critical here to teach that. That's Ellen's grandson and husband there. Um, and then obviously thinking about what you want to communicate. And then the fourth life skill is making connections. And this is all based on symbolic representation, which we've all learned about getting our, our uh, credentials to be teachers and managers. Um, but the, the, the really interesting thing about this life skill, how Ellen defined it is, that making connections is really at the heart of learning, right? Because without the stand for relationship, you, you need that in order to build your knowledge, right? And you do that through experiences and exploration and exposure. The other really important piece here is that how do we promote the opportunity to make unusual connections? Because that's at the core of creativity. 
and and how are we seeing when kids are making unusual connections and how are we providing opportunity for them to do that because that's where innovation happens that's where ideas come that's where fun and, and creative endeavors occur and one way to promote making connections is to play math and science games. These are with a little bit older children, but super important. Um, and this is a really interesting study. And then we have critical thinking, which is really just about how do you know the information you have is valid and reliable, right? Um, and it sounds simple, but you know, with the whole notion of fake news and all the things that have been happening in our country, all that is happening because we're not really thinking about where's the source, where to come from, how do you work it backwards, right? Using the scientific method. Um, so critical thinking is really important. And I love that Ellen has made the connection uh, between curiosity and critical thinking and how if we're engaged and curious, we're gonna be using our critical thinking skills, right? So this is an experiment where they give a child a toy that has these pop-up levers, and then they bring in a new toy. And what they found was what we would assume is that when you have something new or novel, that you're gonna be more curious. You know, you think if you put new toys out, kids will be curious, but really that's one part, but they were more curious when they didn't know how the other toy worked, they wanted to figure out the other toy. So the takeaway with this is stop answering questions so fast, stop trying to fix everything, let them have that time to really start figuring it out. And I think about it like as an adult, the example I share, because when, I, when you can internalize these life skills and understand executive function in your own life, and that's what we do at Mind the Making, we start with the adult first, then you're gonna start seeing all these opportunities with the children. Um, but what I think about, let's say I'm walking down the road and I see a new bird or something in a nest, and I'm like, oh, I wonder what that bird is and how they're making the nest. My husband's with me and he knows and he tells me the name of the bird. I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. But if we both don't know, I might go home, look it up. And then when I'm looking it up, I might even find something else that I'm interested about birds. So you keep learning, you keep growing and learning. You're not shut off with your curiosity. So it takes inhibitory control, tons of inhibitory control for the adults to let the kids stay curious, right? Be curious with them. Don't give them all the answers. And then uh, the sixth skill is taking on challenges. And a part of this module, there, there are eight modules and they're about two hours a piece. So each one is the introduction and then one, one module is each of the life skills. But with taking on challenges, it is part coping with stress, but it goes way beyond that. And this is really important because I've worked in a lot of um, Head Start classrooms. It's really important for us to step back, even if kids are under a lot of stress at home or in their lives, that we do look for fun opportunities for them to choose to do something hard, right? So that they can take on a challenge, whether it's just the toddler who really wants to go down the little slide and they're a little bit scared and they trust you and you can say, hey, you look like you wanna do that. I can go with you or I can hold your hand so that you're helping them do hard things because that's how you stay engaged in life. That's how you wanna learn things is by getting out of your comfort zone. And we talk a lot about, um, Carol Dweck's work here with Mindset. Um, and many of you have heard of Carol Dweck. I'm sure she has a book called Mindset, but basically the research that we show in Mind in the Making is about her growth mindset versus fixed mindset. So a growth mindset is that you can always learn and do better and grow. A fixed mindset is like, this is as good as it gets. Like I'm either not that smart or I'm smart enough and nothing else is gonna happen. And the good news is, is that you can switch mindsets. And you switch mindsets, you get in a growth mindset by doing things that are hard and working hard at it. Um, and that's what we want, because that's how you get to the seventh skill, which is self-directed engaged learning, which is that fire for, for learning and uh, being passionate and curious. And that's what we want for you, especially people working with young children, to have your fire burning bright, that you're showing up, that you're curious, that you're engaged so that you'll see that in the children and keep it going too. And it's really a fun experience. We do a lot of goal setting um, around the life skills because as Phil said, that if you're working towards a goal and it could be a tiny goal, but any goal, if you're working towards something, you're using your executive function. 
right? You're inhibiting yourself, you're thinking, being flexible in your thinking, and you're using your working memory. So one of the takeaways with self-directed engaged learning, we would look at the research and what we really want, especially you people in the field that are really well respected in your communities and have um, a role to advocate for children and families is that um, in the brain, you often, you, well, in, in communities, you often hear and policymakers and everybody, you hear hard skills and soft skills. And they say the soft skills are the social emotional skills and then the hard skills are academics or cognition, right? And what we want you to say is that they're all hard skills, that the brain evidence in the research has shown us that you cannot separate out social emotion and cognition. It's all interrelated in brain. So everything is super important, not just cognition and not just social emotional. And so here's a few ways that we do. We, like I mentioned, in Mind in the Making, we look at ourselves first. So each module, we learn the research, we look at what does this life skill mean to me? And then we look at the uh, more research and then we say, okay, how, what can I do to promote this in the children that I'm working with or in the people that I love around me? Um, and it, it really is transformational in the way that you would even work with your and be with your own families, let alone the families and children that you're serving. Um, and it's fun, it's really fun. And then how do we ensure that we're making sure that this is behavior change? This is the goal setting process that we use by Gabrielle Otogen out of NYU. And she wrote a book called Rethinking Positive Thinking. And um, this goal setting process is called WHOOP. We do it at the end of each module and it's wish, outcome, uh, obstacle and plan. And so you make a wish, then you think about how I'll feel if I make this happen. And it could be, you know, as simple as I'm going to play more games with like, I'm going to play three more games in my classroom each week, right? Let's just say you can do that because you want to promote focus and self-control. How will I feel? I'll be, you know, research into action. I'll be walking my talk. And then you think about your, your obstacle and your obstacle always has to be internal. So you can't say, I don't have enough time or, you know, the kids are acting up too much has to be used. So the obstacle could be, let's say, um, I get distracted or I feel rushed. So then you make a plan. If I start to get distracted or if I start to rush, then I will remember how important games are or check my list of what I was going to do that day. So it's just that precognition of, okay, this might, I might not achieve this because this will happen, but when it does happen, I have a plan. And she has shown this in so many different ways. Her book is really interesting. Um, of how it actually works, because what she's found is that if you only think positive, like, yeah, if you start to visualize your goal and it's there and you're all happy about it, you're way less, less likely to make it happen, to work hard towards it. So that's a really fun part of the learning journey. All right. I know that was a ton and it's super fast, but I'm going to stay on for questions. But at this time, I want to introduce my colleague, Dan Torres, um, who is the manager of Vroom. Um, and he's going to share that free resource with you, and then I'll come back and show you some more free resources, and then we can take questions. So, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you, or I'm going to mute my... Okay, good. <clears throat> Thanks, Erin. Yeah, I'll just jump in real quick, <clears throat> share a few slides, and give you a, a quick primer on Vroom. <clears throat> I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but, um, you know, with this audience, we all know that children are born with tremendous potential, and these five, first five years are really critical. So uh, the problem Vroom attempts to solve is... How do we put this foundational information about brain science in the hands of caregivers in an actionable way where they can use it within their everyday moments with children? And that's really um, the goal uh, of the room program. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And just real quickly, we talked a bit about the brain science already, just for the purposes of room and the room program, uh, the three foundational science principles that um, kind of undergird it are that positive adult child relationships matter. Everything really starts from that place. Uh, back and forth interactions are key uh, between caregiver and child, and then life skills are built in the early years. So those three things are, are grounded in the science and are the big picture ideas behind Vroom, but we knew we had to even distill it further to make it actionable and, and something that caregivers could use in real time in everyday moments. So from that, we built the five brain uh, building basics. And these are um, really the pieces that a caregiver can use that can be translated into actions, right? So if you look at the five brain building basics, the first one is look, 
Um, we really want to use eye contact in our interactions with children. It's very important for brain development. Um, taking turns, it want to be an interactive um, interaction with children, um, very important for, for their development. Um, chat, the importance of speaking to, to children, um, which is something that um, we try to promote more and more of, but uh, lots of dialogue with children, but taking turns, making eye contact while you're doing it. Um, these moments are great. Let's stretch them out. Let's try to stretch out these moments and these interactions with children. So room tips give you ideas on how to stretch out those interactions uh, with children as, as you're working together. And then finally follow. Um, you know, children are just sponges. They are taking in information as they go. Let's follow their lead. Um, let them lead the way, but still kind of promote those other activities in terms of stretching the moments out, speaking to them. Um, taking turns and then making eye contact. So those five things are really important to groom. Um, so the final step for us was how do we get this in, in the hands of caregivers in a way they can use it? And the method we use is tips, right? So this is an example of a vroom tip you're seeing right now. Um, this one is called Home Museum. Um, so you'll see it's really inviting the child to find some special things and put them out like in a museum or a store and have them lead you through their collection and ask them to share with you why the items are meaningful and take turns choosing your favorite things to share with each other. So that's your activity that you can do with the child. And we're hoping that you can build that into um, everyday moments with that child. Um, the research that developed Vroom found it was really, really important to have brainy backgrounds, which is really the brain science paired with that tip. Uh, the parents that um, you know this program was tested on felt that that was really important and then they would be more likely to do the activity if they understood the brain science behind it. Um, so in this case, the brain science is, is in a really uh, parent-friendly language, talking about how the activity is, you know, really promoting practicing important communication skills, and then thinking about what to say and how to say it, and using memory too. So it's really setting up the brainy background behind it. Another thing I'd want to say is all the tips are broken out by age range. So you'll see on this one, Home Museum is for children ages four to five. We have tips from age um, birth to five. So for the early Head Start population, they can we have zero to three tips specifically. Um, every tip is really kind of based on that information about the five brain building basics we talked about earlier. So those are the tips and how they're structured and they're pretty standard across multiple categories. Um, and the last slide I'll show next is um, how do you get it? Right, so how do you get this uh, information? So one, Vroom is free. It's a free resource. Anyone can use it um, right now if they'd like. Um, there are several ways to get the content and share it with uh, caregivers. One is um, through the app. So if you search Vroom on the App Store for Apple or Android, um, it should pop up as one of the top search um, features. And then from there, you can download the app, which is free. The app is available in English and Spanish. Um, the other way to get Vroom is Vroom by text. Um, it's a little bit more streamlined, but if you text Vroom to 48258, um, you can get um, texts that send you tips directly through your phone. That's also available in English and Spanish. Um, it's another way to access the information. And in addition to that, our website has lots of tip sheets that you can download and print as PDFs. Um, and the, the nice thing about our website is some of those tip sheets are available in up to 15 languages. Um, so we've had lots of examples of um, providers that have, you know, a population that, that Arabic is, is really important. They can print out Vroom tips in Arabic, and it's a great way to kind of make a connection to a community that, that a provider um, is trying to reach out to. Um, so that's another uh, feature that we provide through the website particularly. So Vroom is something that we see a lot of providers integrating within their family engagement work. Um, if you have um, any kind of you know, parent group meeting, Vroom tips can be a nice activity that you use um, through those parent events. Um, it can be handed out with, um, with children as they go home as, as activities that parents can do um, you know, when they're not in the program specifically. So it's meant to be flexible. It's meant to be complementary to what you're doing. Um, and it's meant to be something that's an added resource that you can really use to promote the brain science in, in a really practical way. So that's that's the quick uh, one-on-one on Vroom and, and happy to answer questions when we're done. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, Vroom's a no-brainer because you just you can download it and you should go to the website and see the free resources that are just incredible, little posters you can put up and all kinds of things um, to use in your environment. 
the other the other free resources that we have that are readily available um, are skill building book tips. So we pick 98 children's books, uh, matched them to life skill and age, and then wrote some tips on how to promote executive function or the life skill in the book. Um, and you can get those at mindofthemaking.org if you just go to the resources tab. They're in English and Spanish, and they're a great homeschool connection, you know, between home and school. They're also great when we start having your volunteers come back into your classroom. They've been very useful for like the grandparent program and stuff like that. Um, and those are free. So they're also all of the books that we picked are available at First Book. So if you are, um, First Book is a reduced price marketplace if you're serving 70% more in poverty, which I'm sure all of your Head Start programs do. You can join First Book and, and buy these. You get hardback books for like a dollar or two. So and so every book that we picked are, is available through First Book. Um, and then we also have skill building opportunities, which are take commonly asked questions from parents um, and how to turn that challenge or that problem into an opportunity to promote a life skill. These are great, easy printouts. Like if you have a lot of biters or you have, you know, I'm sure tons of you have toilet training questions from families. Um, you can just print those out for free. And they also are mindinthemaking.org and they're in English and Spanish. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. B to share with you the opportunities through National Head Start with um, the Bezos Family Foundation, Dan and I's work, um, and how we can, um, how the how National Head Start Association can get this information to you if you're interested in more. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. Lots of good information for everybody. Um, I want to just I want to say a couple of things. First, if you're not using Vroom, that's something that's available to all of you. Um, I saw some folks in the chat say that they're using it, and so if you see somebody there, you might connect with them just to see how they're using it. It sounds like they've had a lot of success, and I would imagine it um, it creates a really interesting way to connect with parents. Um, and then Mind in the Making uh, and Vroom, we we work. NHSA works directly with Mind in the Making, and our goal is to help promote this kind of connection with children and families by training folks who can become trainers of Mind in the Making in their communities. So we have um, a cohort of folks who have already been trained, and, can, and we create cohorts of what we call train the trainer events which allows you or someone at your program, if there's a more appropriate person at your program, to go through a 16 hour training module uh, with somebody who is experienced and receive uh, a certificate that will then allow you to become a trainer in your community. Um, and our hope is through the NHSA network to be able to really spread the mind in the making work um, virally really through um, our programs and our communities, partnerships in the community. Um, we have some folks who actually work as consultants and they go do mind in the making training and earn extra money doing that. Um, and some folks come get trained through their program and then they provide the training as part of their job. So it becomes kind of a professional development piece of their uh, repertoire that they're able to offer. So um, if you're interested in that, um, you can certainly reach out to NHSA to me directly. I will put, I, I know my um, email was up there, but I'll put it here too, so you can grab it um, if you prefer to, to contact me directly. Um, it, it, it's a way of taking what you've seen today and really putting it into action in your program and in your community. Um, so any questions you can put in the chat if you guys have any questions for um, either of the presenters. I see a question about Vroom. Is it a parent engagement platform? It absolutely is. That's exactly what it is. Um, and uh, it's unique. And what's really interesting is with the onset of the pandemic and everyone adjusting to a more virtual environment, um, it's probably even easier than ever to engage parents this way because we've kind of been doing 
this sort of virtual thing for so long that it isn't that unusual anymore. So it's, it's a, something that I think you'll find folks pretty easily uh, can adapt to. Um, somebody asked the question, who was the person you said wrote about building in the goal setting process? Uh, it's Gabrielle Otigen, and she wrote Rethinking Positive Thinking. Um, email me about the cost of the NHSA trainings. We only charge for the train the trainer, um, and it depends on whether we're doing it as a single group or if you're enrolling individually. And some of that, I, I wanna make sure that I quote that properly. So just shoot me an email and I'll get you all of that information. Um, very affordable. It's very affordable. This is really just to cover the costs of, our, um, of, of the folks who are doing the work. Um, and the requirements to be a trainer, there aren't um, specific resume requirements, but we do want to make sure I mean, you do need to think about your role, your current role and your experience doing adult education, because it, it is a, a process of training adults. Um, you have to be comfortable with that. And right now, I mean, I think this will start to change, but right now it's we're, we're just doing virtual training right now. So um, we think that'll change over the next six months or so, but you do need to be really comfortable in this environment. And we've had some folks say, you know, let us know when you're back face to face because they just don't, they, they have a hard time managing the technology and the people. Now we are keeping the groups really small and I think that's helpful, but, um, and we have some folks doing it and they're saying it's working great, but you do need to be comfortable with it. That's a personal thing. Jeanette, are you asking for my email address? I put it in there, I'll do it again. I don't know if you are hoping to reach. Um, okay, Dan I might have Aaron. missed that. My apologies. That's okay. I just wanted to make sure you wanted uh -huh. mine and not Dan or or Aaron. I don't know if they really want to. Yeah, put their just email to find out information. There. Yeah, on the training. Yeah, please email okay. me. That would be great. All right, thank you. And it is a professional. I mean, it should be professional growth. I, I guess it depends on what your programs and your requirements are. But if you're, you know required to do certain number of hours or get certificates and that kind of thing. It certainly is a, a, a very legitimate um, professional development opportunity. Um, well, we are uh, up on the hour. So I'm going to um, thank our guests and um, let them jump on, I'm sure to their next <laughs> meeting as we do throughout these, these uh, virtual experiences. I'm so excited to have such a big group today. Thanks for showing up. Remember next time our EHS Rising event in two weeks is going to be on um, language and speech development in infants and toddlers. I am super excited about that. I think it's such an interesting topic. I hope you'll join us again. And thank you, Aaron and Dan for your time today. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thanks everybody.